Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we are having a special summer series where we explore Jewish ideas, Jewish portrayals, religious portrayals in fiction, nonfiction, and documentary filmmaking. I'm so excited to share this series with you, and this podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas. So be sure to check out 1840.org, where you can find videos, articles, and recommended readings. So I am so excited to introduce our summer series. I was thinking, what could 1840 do to contribute to people's summertime off, help exhale a little bit? A lot of our topics can sometimes be a little bit on the heavy side, and just imagining somebody sitting uh, beachside or going bike riding, listening to, I don't know, some professor or philosopher talk about Jewish studies or some family negotiating their religious differences, it just was a little hard for me to imagine, so I wanted to do something special, particularly for the summertime, and I don't know about you or what you do over the summertime, but there's no question that for me, the summer is all about sitting outside with books, articles, getting to read, sitting at night, getting to watch something that's interesting, that's exciting, that's uplifting. And I decided that what I thought we could do uh, over the next few weeks is explore depictions of religious ideas, Jewish ideas in different mediums, going through nonfiction fiction, and documentary filmmaking, and explore a little bit about how religious change, religious ideas, religious growth, particularly within the Jewish community, are depicted within these different mediums. And I am so excited about the discussion today, particularly about nonfiction writing, because I think for myself, what I enjoy reading most is nonfiction. As I've mentioned, I think a few times, I've probably read less than a handful of fiction books in the last 20, 30 years, Uh, not not 30 years, last 20 years at least. Uh, I grew up reading like John Grisham and Michael Crichton. That was very exciting. But at some point, I just began reading nonfiction. And part of what I think that change was is that nonfiction writing really went through a renaissance. It really allowed a sort of narrative storytelling that was usually associated with fiction writing. Nonfiction became more and more just this area of people transmitting stories and ideas that actually happened that I was just drawn to it. And for myself, when I go on vacation, I print out these long form articles from my favorite publications. I have lists of my favorite. New Yorker articles, Atlantic articles, books, or whatever it is, and I just sit and I enjoy reading. Uh, Not everybody does, so if you do, I apologize. You can always go back and look at some of our previous uh, episodes, but this is going to be a great deal about writing, but particularly about writing and the Jewish community. I think the article that made me think most about the art of writing is an article that I've quoted 101 times in things that I've written. And it's a book by the former editor of Tradition Magazine, Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, who's actually the brother of the Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Aaron Feldman, uh, when I was studying in Nair Yisrael. Rabbi Emanuel Feldman was a long-serving editor for Tradition Magazine. He's collected his articles in in books, and he has these absolutely brilliant takes, and so many of them have to do with how we depict and share our community. There's one article in particular that I think about constantly when it comes to writing, and that is his article, Tefillin in a Brown Paper Bag, where he writes as follows. The use of deficient language has practical negative consequences as well, for it prevents us, the Jewish community, from preaching to anyone but the Orthodox choir. Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, who's writing in tradition and talking about ideas from within the Orthodox Jewish community, 
is emphasizing the need to be able to develop ideas that can reach from people outside who didn't grow up in an insular yeshiva world necessarily or went to seminary yeshiva and all of this, but can reach beyond. He writes as follows, I'll continue. Intelligent, educated, non-Orthodox Jews will surely be put off by the Argot, which passes for much of the Torah Judaica today. I love that he used the word Argot, A-R-G-O-T. I do not see that word very often. By and, and I have no idea if I'm pronouncing it properly. By and large, we do not quite literally or illiterally speak or write their language. For jargon, by definition, is a simple elemental form of communication, which includes only the initiated and eliminates everyone else from the discussion. It is hard to imagine that any thinking individual can be persuaded of the depths of Torah when quite beyond grading misusages such as being that instead of since, comes to tell us instead of informs us, brings down, this is my favorite, instead of cites, with a C, C C-I-T-E-S, the ideas of Torah are presented in jejun and puerile language. I may be mispronouncing a lot of his fancy words, but as I've mentioned before, Whenever somebody mispronounces a word, it's usually because they've only learned it through writing itself, through reading. This is a pity, he writes, for Torah is precious enough to deserve elegance, grace, sophistication, and precision. After all, we don't wrap our tefillin in brown paper bags or bind our Sifre Torah with coarse, ugly ropes. A worldview which is inadequately articulated not only fails to communicate, but repels those whom it would reach. And his argument, which I love that imagery, we don't wrap our tefillin in brown paper bags or bind our Sifre Torah with coarse, ugly ropes, about the encasing of our ideas, about writing with a certain clarity, a certain precision, a certain majesty and beauty, needs to reflect the very content of the ideas we're sharing. It's not enough to share beautiful ideas in ugly cases, But the very medium through which we share our ideas, the grammar, the words, the syntax, and the structure all play a role in reflecting the very majesty of Torah that we are trying to share. And you should absolutely read that article. It's worth reading. And part of why I am so excited about my conversation today with Mrs. Avital Chizik Goldschmidt. I may have mispronounced her name. Also, I don't often call her by her uh, chizik. I believe that's how she pronounces it. I'm sure you can uh, write in. But she is a dear, dear friend of mine, and I would say a mentor of sorts, which we discuss in my own writing. When I share ideas, she is on that very short list of people who I send articles to and ask for her comments, and she's been incredibly helpful to me. I think any time that you write, it is literally an act of emuna. It is an act of faith. Any act of creativity is an act of faith. But it's not just an act of faith in that we look to God or you look to some higher power asking you to give out your idea. It's an act of emuna and faith in that it's both faith in God that that inspiration and creativity will emerge. It's about a certain faith in yourself, in your ability to have the strength to share ideas and be subject to criticism and feedback and all that other stuff. But writing and sharing ideas more than anything else, I think, is an act of faith in the community itself who you are sharing those ideas with. It's an act of faith in speaking at a high level with substance, with clarity, and not speaking down or writing down, in this case, to the communities and people and individuals, families, who you are trying to reach. I think that's why... I'm so excited to speak with Avital. Avital is an incredibly accomplished writer. And what I've done, because so much of our interview relates to her process and the process of writing and how it interfaces with the community, I've also asked her to share three recommendations of what our listeners can be reading and thinking about now in the summertime. And we go through three of those and stick around for the end of the episode because I am going to share my three nonfiction recommendations about Jewish life at the very end of the episode. Things that you could find online, download, read on the beach, wherever you are, but enjoy them because what greater joy is there in the summertime than immersing yourself 
in reading. I'm so happy to introduce my conversation with Avital Kazuk Goldschmidt. Avital, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to begin because I know when I write something and before I'm going to submit it to get it published, there are a few people who I send uh, my own writing around to, and you are definitely at the top of that list. I'll tell that story uh, in a little bit of articles of mine that you've saved from the trash bin or from just being uh, far less than excellent. I wanted to begin by talking about, you're really a a prolific writer. You write in so many different outlets, both Jewish outlets, non-Jewish outlets, but your themes do center around religious subject matter. And I wanted to begin by talking about your writing process. What is your writing process? How do you pick a subject? And like, I'm always curious, like, where do you write? Tell me a little bit about your writing process. How do you go from a blank page to one of your extraordinarily thoughtful articles. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, Well, I'll say like this. I grew up with my father, who is a physicist at Bell Labs, always telling me, write what you know. Um, And I try to write what I live, what I see. I think we all do naturally. Um, You know, it doesn't mean that everything is for my personal life, of course, but over the years I've grown increasingly I think spurred by readers and by members of the from community who reach out and say, you know, this is really interesting and no one is going to write about it other than you. Can you write about it? Um, so that's usually sort of how a story comes up. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it is something for my personal life, but I think increasingly I like to remove myself from the frame as much as I can because it's not about me. It's about my subjects. Um, I think also many times my subjects come through community work, uh, which I don't really talk about much publicly, but it's a huge part of my life, Um, all consuming, in fact, and just sitting in the front row, observing. I, you know, I interact with dozens of people in real life every single week. I have a dozen people around my table for every Shabbos meal. And really in every capacity, every single day, I feel like I'm faced with real and fascinating questions about religion, about faith, leadership, politics, ambitions, and sometimes life and death. Um, so there, I, I feel like I'm, life is rich with material, um, and I feel like there are stories from every sort of angle. Um, in terms of where I write, uh, morning- Like physically, like the geography of where you write, when you write, this is what I love hearing about. I hope our listeners do too, but I could talk about this all day. I love to listen to this also from writers, um, and actually I, w- I was always sort of very intimidated by writers who write standing. You know, historically there were a few great writers who wrote standing. They had like a standing stender, um, a standing desk, and I, I want to get there. Um, at, this point, <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I usually write in a coffee shop here on the Upper East Side in the mornings. I have a few spots that are sort of like Parisian in style, so I'd like to imagine myself a Hemingway. Um, and afternoons and evenings, I write in my study where I am right now. Um, so I, I look at a nice townhouse and it's, I think it's pretty quaint. Um, but I think the truth is a writer is always writing, um, mentally. I'm writing as I walk in the street and you bet that I am writing in shul (laughs) in my mind. Um, I think my mom once scolded me actually for bringing a notebook to a funeral. (laughs) I just, I just could not hold back because... You know, it was like a Russian Jewish immigrant funeral, a relative, and like there was so much to unpack there. You know, there's trauma, there's immigration, there's, you know, assimilation. Like, it's so interesting, but it, it's a chronic problem. Um, and I think, you know, the, always the big question is really on Shabbos, what do you do? And Shabbos is really when the best ideas come up, and I'm sure that's true for you as well, um, because we're so unplugged and we have that ability to really sort of dig deep. Um, so that by the end of Shabbos, I'm, you know, I usually have a list of terms to memorize that I memorize that I need to jot down. And do you write initially uh, by hand or on a computer? Uh, it really depends. I'm not like particular about it. I could do anything I could do. by. You could write, write by, by hand. hand. Yeah, for sure. I write. Um, I try actually when I go on vacation, I try to write only by hand because once I'm on a, on a tech device, it feels like work. Um, and then I actually, recently I got an iPad and I use that a lot to write as well. 
I can only write lists by hand. So if it's a grocery list, if it's a top five list, I can write bullet pointed lists. Uh, that's really all I can do by hand. I can't even write a full sentence by hand. I'm, I'm just, just a, a few more questions about the process itself. When you, when you finish your first draft, typically how many drafts are you writing before you send it in to your editor? So it really depends on what I'm writing. Um, straight beat reporting is very formulaic, um, which is frankly why I left it. I really wanted to experiment more with my craft. You know, I want to be doing reporting, but really focusing more on long form features that dig deeply into an issue, what it means and why it matters. Um, and I find, find most reporting is sort of fueled by adrenaline. So you like you find one source, then another, and you sort of build your way up until you have a story that is hopefully well-rounded and dynamic and you have sort of the right amount of sor voices and sources and data, et cetera. So that I find is pretty straightforward. Um, and honestly, working sort of in, you know, starting in Haaretz and then going on to the forward, I had this amazing boot camp of learning how to like just crank that out. Um, and then I taught it in Stern, of course. So I feel like that is a very straightforward process. Uh, the question is more interesting, I think, when you come to sort of essay writing, uh, something that's a little bit more of a step back. Uh, it's quite different. And I find essays usually cook for a very long time. It's really a chillin'. Like I let it simmer on a low flame for a long time. Um, my next essay is a personal one. It has been several weeks in the works. Um, you know, I write it, I put it down, I come back to it. It's a process. I have someone else read it. I have another person read it. Uh, and others take even longer than that. I have one essay uh, related to women's issues, actually, that I wrote in 20... I want to say it was late. It was 2019 at some point. I don't remember what month. I was at the forward. It was, it was a very strong essay. It was sharp, you know, fiery. And I'll never forget, we had already loaded it into the content management system and we were about to schedule it for the next morning, or maybe it was already scheduled. It was mamish, it was done, you know, it was edited, everything was great, it's gonna make a big splash tomorrow, so exciting. And then some things happened in shul that afternoon and I realized there's no way I can do this. I consulted with my husband and we realized it would be too radioactive in that moment of time and it would have to wait. And um, Jane Eisner, who was then editor in chief, walked into my office and asked, you know, are we all set for tomorrow to publish? And I just started crying. And she was so shocked. She totally understood. She nodded. She was like, don't worry about it. You know, real life comes first. Um, but it was a very hard moment. And I opened this essay still to this day. It's never been published every few months. And I reread it and I wonder, will I be ready to publish it? When? I don't know, maybe. But, um, you know, that's a piece that's, literally two years old uh, that I'm still working on. I feel like I'm just, you know, haven't come to that point that I'm ready to publish it. It's, it's in the slow cooker still. No, I remember the article that I was referring to that I, I really think you saved from oblivion and not having the impact was I, right when the pandemic began, I wrote an article about spending a Pesach Seder alone. And I sent you a first draft and I remember you looked at it and you had such brilliant advice. You said your last paragraph is just a flop. And you said, that's always where you flop. I think it's because we're so used to sermons that kind of end with like this general blessing, you know, Bimhera be amenu amen. The temple should be rebuilt speedily in our days. And you kind of like give a peace sign and run away from it. And you, you pushed me to sit with it longer, find a way to wrap this up without getting pedantic or too overt about your message. Let your message sit in your listener's mind rather than you cramming it down. And I rewrote the entire ending. And I now anytime I write something, like I always take a second glance at that last paragraph, which is so often like the belly flop of the writing process because you're you're 90 you're percent of the way there yeah yeah i think um you know i had one teacher in Berea. her name was is margea pupko she's an amazing english teacher and she had this term that she would describe it as cool guy at the party you in writing you want to arrive late and you want to leave early you want to be the cool guy at the party you don't want to belabor your point point. and it's funny i remember that term for all these years and i sort of usually when i'm editing i take out my opening and I cut out the ending. Um, and it's natural that we do that. As you said, sermons, drushes are written that way. 
And also um, just in general, we're taught in school that you need a beginning, a middle and a conclusion, right? But that's not really how like great, I think writing really works. Um, and I think the other point that you make that really kind of emerges here is that I believe in assuming that my reader is smart and respecting my reader, expecting the reader to be able to read between the lines and what I'm trying to say, right? I'm not gonna lay it all out for you. That's not my job. That's the beauty of reading is processing and trying to understand what the point of this is. I am absolutely obsessed with that imagery. Cool guy at the party writing. I'm going to take that with me for some time. Let's start with how you got your start with writing. What do you consider, because I know this is a tricky question, different people may consider different their, um, pieces their first published piece. When you look back, and particularly about religious and Jewish issues, what do you consider your first published piece? So I really started publishing very early at the age of 11 or 12. Um, you know, little things, little newspapers locally. Um, so I'm not going to count that. But that was a very formative part of becoming a writer, though, was sort of allowing that to become part of my identity and also giving you sort of the confidence that you could write, that you have something to say at a young age. Um, my first sort of, I think, published piece that I think made an impact that was that differentiated itself was um, a piece I wrote, an essay I wrote in 2012 for a tablet. Uh, I was finishing up Stern at the time and I wrote a very fiery essay called Tights Squeeze. I did not come up with that headline, but it was a cold pitch. Um, and it was an essay about sort of the culture. It, it was focused on girls schools, but it was in the Orthodox community, but it was really a broader point. Um, the piece was about sort of our culture of stringencies, our Humra culture, where we have to sort of constantly prove to one another how religious we are, how from we are, how stringent. And I argued in the piece that for me, and I wrote it from a very sort of, very much as a daughter of, you know, Bali Chuva, newcomers to religion. My parents became religious as I was growing up. Um, you know, I, I was very idealistic about, about our choices as a family and my choices as an individual to be an observant Jew. And for me, you know, it was sort of a shocking culture to, in, to encounter because I thought, you know, I sort of defined modesty um, not about the details, but rather we should be modest about our piety, right? We should not, you know, sort of flaunt to the world how religious we are and how so strict we are and that this sort of creates a toxic culture. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was, I wouldn't have written that piece, obviously, t today. I mean, I think the point still stands, but the, the style is definitely, my style has changed dramatically, but I had all these like little like fiery anecdotes in which I sort of tried to conjure this culture. And I think it captured something for people where, you know, the reaction was overwhelming. It was also around the time of the riots in Beit Shemesh. There was a sort of, there was sure. a lot of tension on the ground, if you remember that. Um, so people were very passionate about that issue specifically at that time. And it really sort of like struck a nerve. Um, I, had never thought that I would write about religion. I had never thought I would write about community issues. I had a teacher in high school who would always say, you know, one day you're gonna write about this. And I sort of laughed because I thought, you know, it's it's just my life. Like what what's there to write about? It's just my day-to-day -day life. And then obviously as I grew older, I realized there's a lot of material here and there's a lot that could be done here through writing. Um, so that was sort of my first piece. It was a very shocking experience because I was 20 years old. Um, I, you know, the piece went viral and this is back when articles went viral on Facebook. <laughs> um, and people were, you know, I was like overwhelmed with messages, people writing to me, thank you. You know, you really captured something I experienced. Um, many people sort of, I had a lot of messages from people who basically had like left community or had like sort of changed their observances because of these issues that I, outlined um, and they said like they said that to me um, that this was why they left and it was very it was and it was an interesting experience it was very anxiety inducing because I was just like a more private person and then suddenly I was not um, and you know I was 20 years old and I was in Stern like that's not where you know I, I wasn't planning on being a rabble rouser that was not my plan um, but Hashem has his ways so you, we're already kind of coming on to that about you have really forged a path about what 
it means to write about Jewish and religious issues. And I wanted to dig a little bit deeper because I know any time a movie comes out or Jews are in the news or any time that there is a depiction of more broadly religious life and more specifically Orthodox Jewish life, there is a visceral reaction of people in the community wanting to see their own experience uh, on the page. And the level of scrutiny that your own community can give your own writing is oftentimes much higher level of scrutiny than they would have reading about a different religious community or just a general issue, a political issue. So what do you see as the primary challenges and opportunities of writing about Jewish and religious subjects? So I think the challenges are obvious. Um, it actually begins earlier than the publication. It starts with the process. The process itself is challenging as people, you know, especially when you're doing reporting, people are very uncomfortable talking on the record, um, even about very basic things. You could not imagine the amount of uh, people I've reached out to, to really talk about something that's seriously not controversial and the fear that people have about talking on the record and even anonymously at times, people are just so uncomfortable with that sort of exposure. Um, and, you know, it's legitimate. I'm not gonna question that emotion and I won't pressure people to speak if they're not comfortable with it, but it's it's sort of just, it's sort of like pulling teeth at times. Um, so just getting those words, getting other people's words on the page, not just my own, um, is difficult. And then of course, there's always the aftermath. There's the backlash. People feel uncomfortable with exposure. Um, as a community, I think we have a, a sort of siege mentality. And some of it, I really believe, is inherited trauma. I think this constant fear of anti-Semitism being spurred by something bad in the media um, is is sort of, you know, a, a, a product of that. <clears throat> of course, you know, I, I think that it's still necessary, this exposure. Um, and I think some of it is also sort of politicized, right? It's politically convenient to be able to say we shouldn't talk about anything in our community. No one should know. Um, so those are sort of the obvious challenges and I'm happy to tell you more <laughs> about those stories. Um, the opportunities I've realized over time that because I write about a small enough community, the impact is in a way deeper. Um, you know, I've thought about leaving Jewish media. I've interviewed this past year with a few major publications, uh, non-Jewish for general roles that would be sort of like obvious career boosters. Um, but I sort of, through that process, realized that's just not what I want to do. Um, I see the impact of my stories in real time. The amount of letters that I get from, from rabbis, from mental health professionals, from educators about my work, about a story that spoke to them, about a story that I tried to capture, something that they see in their day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, you know, they appreciate that I articulated something or that I shed light on it. Uh, and I do it, I try to do it in a sort of, you know, in a careful way. And they appreciate that someone is out there doing something and saying something. And you start to realize that the pen is a deeply powerful thing. I, I think I was sort of skeptical about its power in the beginning of writing. And and now I'm at a point where I just, I see that the real impact it can have for people and sort of sometimes in just sort of taking on a big issue and like laying it out, explaining all the sort of the factors there, um, all the political players, let's say. And, or sometimes if it's an essay, if it's a critical essay, right? I'm saying something that people may be uncomfortable saying. Um, so I've, there's, there's so much room for that impact and it's a real impact. Like I, I meet people all the time in real life, not just messages, who say, you know, who mention an essay that I wrote at some point, you know, and like that it, it moved them, that it made them think differently. And that is such an incredible opportunity. Do you have a piece that you are most proud of publishing? And do you have a piece that I'm trying to phrase it the right way, simply put the least proud of publishing or one that got negative feedback that you came to agree with or see your own writing in a different light? You could start with the good stuff. If, uh, if <laughs> I actually, the second one is the thing that comes to mind sooner. The thing I'm most proud of, I can't really choose. <laughs> um, well, well, I noticed that you pin on your Twitter account. You've written a lot. You pin a piece that you wrote about davening, about prayer. 
And I've always been struck by the fact that you've written and published quite a bit, but the one piece that you pin on your Twitter account, and it's in an important outlet, it's not, it's in Vox, it's not the most important outlet that you've published in. You've been published by the Times and other mainstream multiple times. And I don't know, I've always looked at that. I'm sorry that I'm giving a Freudian analysis to your pinned tweets. That's a new, uh, a new, a new area of psychological analysis now that I'm done with analyzing people's bookshelves, which I'm doing also simultaneously. Uh, but I also analyze people's pinned tweets. And to me, there's something very um, basic, very foundational about that piece of what you're sharing. That in a way, I don't know, it's about prayer, but to me, you pin it because... Your writing, in a way, always feels prayerful. That it's both, it's both looking at a community and also praying for whatever issues and personalities that it is covering. There's an optimism. There is a uh, a prayerful aspect to hopefully elevate those stories. I'm sorry if I'm doing a deep Freudian read of that pin tweet again, but but it always struck me that you decided to pin a piece on prayer. That's a very thoughtful interpretation. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, I, I love the analysis of pin tweets, right? I think people who are not on Twitter don't understand it, but people who are understand that. Let me just jump in what that means. That's the tweet that under your profile, you can pin it so it always appears immediately under your Twitter profile. I have just just... Um, shameless plugs to buy my books and read my articles. It's not classy, but that's, I just changed my pin tweet this week. But you have your prayer article. Tell me, why is that the one that you pinned? And and am I correct in that you may be something that you're most proud of? It's such a great, you know, I didn't think of that immediately, but um, yeah, I think it really, that piece really sort of shares my worldview in a way. Um, and I also, I pinned it on Twitter largely because the article itself talks about social media and how for me, prayer is in many ways an antidote to what social media I think is doing to us as a society and as individuals psychologically. Um, so for me, I felt like, for me being on Twitter is a, you know, it's, it's very busy of it. It's not ideal. It's suboptimal. The necessary evil. The necessary evil, right. And um, we could talk more about that too. But for me, it's it's not something that I really want to be spending time on or investing in. But I know I sort of, I have to, to an extent. Um, so for me, sort of putting that at the top of my profile was almost, you know, maybe it's a message to others. But for me, I did it for myself, sort of like a reminder, like this, this is not important. This is what happens online is, yeah, it's important and it can impact and it can do great things, but this is not what matters in life. Um, so I sort of, for me, it's, you know, Dalif Nemi Atal made, you know, know from, know from before whom you stand, right? And that, that was sort of my version of that. Um, the piece itself really speaks about how I think prayer is, you know, there's a there's a way to look at prayer in sort of like this modern light uh, in a way that I think many millennials might even gain from, right? Meditation and all this sort of wellness stuff is on a rise for a reason. Uh, and for me as a religious Jew, prayer is my answer. No, I love that because there is a lot of talk about the modern application of Shabbos and how Shabbos is this kind of refuge from technology, from social media and what I thought the piece does so beautifully is it, it, Shabbos is almost the more obvious analogy, and it reminds you that you can create that Shabbos experience daily in your life through prayer itself. Um, and as a kind of an, an epitaph that you kind of place on your social media account as a reminder, uh, that, that's a part of the writing process too, not to get dragged in that daily. I, I do want to come back to that, but I do want to hear the uh, second part of the question, unless you have another vote for the one you're most proud of, um, about an article that, again, whether it's least proud of or one that after criticism and feedback, you look back at it and say, you know what? The, um, they were right. My critics were right. I need to re-examine what I wrote there. I'll start off by saying I often find that the negative feedback is very 
is largely emotional, not always, but largely it is emotional responses. Um, it really deals with the issue at hand. Um, meaning, l- l- let me just flush out, flush that out. Meaning, it's not a reaction to what you wrote. It's the visceral emotional reaction to the subject matter almost. To the subject matter, maybe to how it was written, maybe to who, who was the person behind it, or maybe to what publication it was in, right? So the, it could be many different things, but it's rarely about sort of the main point. And sometimes it will be like, well, it was the way you said it and how you did it. It was uncomfortable. But really, it's just the issue was that I said it. And that also, frankly, that I'm a woman. And, you know, I I don't like to do that. I don't like to pull out the misogyny card. I don't do that frequently. But over the years, I've sort of realized like, oh, men can say that and get away with it. No problem. But if I say that, then it's a problem. Um, so You know, and people might be uncomfortable that I didn't couch something with a million disclaimers that make people feel a little bit more comfortable. But writing is not supposed to make you comfortable. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to, you know, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Say that again. Say say that again, Avital. That was lovely. Well, it's not my line. It's Peter Finley Dunn, who is a a journalist at the turn of the century, uh, who said that a journalist's job is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Um, And I think that obviously that relates to all journalism, but specifically to community journalism and religious journalism, that is something that we don't do enough of. And that's sort of one of my leading sort of mantras and what I try to do. Um, And it's very, I get it. It's very uncomfortable. I too would rather just be comfortable and not have to think about things, right? And sort of embrace my privileges. But, But that's not what God put us on this earth to do. So having said that, um, you know, there are certainly moments where I've, uh, you know, gotten negative feedback where someone said, you know, you did something, you know, wrong or you, you know, got a, you included the wrong quote or something. And sometimes I, I agree, uh, but it usually takes me years to afterwards to see it and some like <laughs> wising and maturing. Yeah, because in the moment you're really, you know, wrapped up in the piece. But then, you know, there's one specific piece that I wrote that was actually a sort of conservative take uh, for Haaretz about, it was, I think, 2013. And it was about uh, young women who were trying to do traditionally male rituals at the time. Uh, I think it was at SAR High School. There was a young woman who wanted to put on tefillin. And there was a scandal at the moment. And I was asked to write a response sort of from an orthodox perspective. And my argument was that this you know, tefillin is not the most pressing problem for women today in that Orthodox women uh, face much greater, <clears throat> more basic challenges in equality and being respected as thought leaders and so on. Um, and that, you know, this is, I forgot what the words were that I used, but I was like, that's not what I want. That's, you know, that feminism is not mine. Um, and I got criticism actually from sort of, I would say, mainstream Orthodox thinkers who said that I did not acknowledge the way that halacha and, you know, halachic rituals establish authority inevitably. And I think they're absolutely right. But that's not something I would have understood at that age. I was 22 years old. I had grown up my entire life, you know, in old girls schools, no brothers. I, I barely like I wasn't in that world to understand it enough. Um, you know, to understand the way that halacha can, you know, give that authority and that someone who's not sort of, you know, working within the, within the same, uh, you know, religious laws is, is just disadvantaged in the end of the day in some ways. I'm not saying change the law, but I'm just saying those are the realities. Um, so I stand by that original point, um, which is that Religious women face larger challenges than this for the most part, but I should have acknowledged that head on. I think one of the most jarring pieces that you ever wrote that I come back and think about um, was the story you did on abortions in the Orthodox community. And I'm curious about what was the feedback backlash uh, from that piece, I mean, that's a very sensitive subject to reach out to people who have had abortions. That's obviously treading on extraordinarily sensitive halachic grounds. And I'm curious, in a piece like that, how do you balance your personal religious identity and the piece that you're sharing with the world? Because um, they don't always cohere. And it's not always an opinion piece that you're writing. 
it, you you find a way to kind of take an issue and build a narrative around it. So in a piece like that, using that as an example, how did you manage your personal religious identity, both in the process and even more so in the aftermath? Because I do think you got a lot of criticism for that. Well, I don't remember. I don't remember no? the criticism. But the truth is, I block it out. I don't I don't keep a tally of it at all. Like, if you do that, you're lost. You, you won't get into this work. You won't do the, a good job in this. Um, but the piece itself, it's funny that you asked this question, because the thing that sort of pushed me to do it, uh, there were two things, two sort of triggers for me with that piece. One was there was, you know, sort of, I don't remember even exactly what was going on, but there was discussion of Roe v. Wade at that moment. Um, and, you know, the usual sort of orthodox pundits were pushing, you know, one agenda. Um, and I was watching that online and I was like, this is kind of, this is just very absolutist. And the other trigger for me was, um, was actually watching my husband deal with questions around this topic. And, you know, this is something that I think any, any religious woman in childbearing age who has, you know, friends who are having children, you know, someone who's had to have a, a pregnancy termination. It's not, you know, it's, it's not so uncommon. Um, so between just sort of living with many friends who have had to go through this or know someone who went through this, right? It's not, it's not so unusual. And then, unfortunately, and then, you know, and then also watching my husband get a few Shilas, a few questions within, I don't remember, within that year or so um, from people, I would say, of very different backgrounds, but people come to a rabbi with these questions, which I thought was also so interesting, right? Um, even people who are sort of like less observant, who find in that moment, they need pastoral guidance. And looking at it as, as a woman and as a mother, and then also in a way as a rabbit and as someone who sees these questions and who understands the importance of pastoral guidance in that moment and who sees women whose hands have been metaphorically held, you know, by, by that pastoral guide. Um, and those stories don't get told either, either, right? I think often, you know, people want to hear the very sensational stories, but what I loved about that piece was not done by me. These were the stories that the women told me. What I loved about it was that the women spoke about going to rabbis and asking for help and asking for advice. And that sometimes the rabbi said, yes, do it. Right now, we know that if you are someone who lives within the sphere of the rabbinate, you understand that behind closed doors, there's a lot of flexibility. Halacha is built to be that way. Right. Um, obviously, you know, with with great halachic legal minds, but but you understand that the reality behind closed doors is very different from what is said in the public square. And I wanted to try to sh shine a light on that without having to say, state it explicitly. Um, and I think the, the reaction was, again, I don't remember the criticism. I'm sure there was, but I didn't. No, I, I don't think there was criticism to the piece. I think that any time that somebody writes about an issue related to intimacy or something deeply private in the orthodox community there the i don't think the reaction was to the content i think the subject matter i remember was maybe criticism the wrong word there was like an audible gasp like oh, we're writing about this now like and and i think that i think there was something very moving about the fact that you gave language to that narrative to be honest i think a lot of the gasp was not to get political here, but I think we have been inevitably affected by evangelical Christian perspectives on these things um, and the way that we talk about them, right? And that I think contributes to that gasp. I don't know if it's a necessarily authentic gasp, so to speak. So tell me a little bit, let's go back to what has shaped you as a writer. Can you tell me a little bit about who are your writing role models? Who are the ones who shaped the way you approach a piece, living or deceased? So mostly deceased. <laughs> I grew up reading a lot of classical literature uh, and much of it actually Russian. My parents are from the former Soviet Union and Russian is my first language. Uh, so, you know, my mother handed me War and Peace at the age of 12 and said, read it. Uh, and by the way, I was a slacker. Bye -bye. No, I, I've always bragged that I was reading John Grisham at the age of uh, 11 or 12. I, I certainly was not reading Dostoevsky or uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother level. 
Tolstoy, yeah, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> but I was a slacker, by the way, because I wasn't reading it in the original Russian and French, and I was reading it in translation, you know? Gotcha. You know, I really adored Chekhov and Turgenev. They were the masters of the Russian sort short story. And I mention this because I think I had, this had a huge effect on me, more than I could ever realize. I... I grew up with two very different rhythms, rhythms of language from an early age, and then three, of course, um, the moment I started learning Hebrew in school. And, you know, in my family, there was a major focus, like with, I think, most Russian Jewish families on studying literature and memorizing poetry, actually. Uh, I was never so good about it, but there was like this expectation that children at, you know, a family party must stand up and recite a poem of Pushkin. Like a Frum family would have a Dvar Torah, you know, Russians have a poem said. Um, so, and it, I think it seeps into your writing by osmosis, even if you don't mean it, sort of, even if it's something, you know, even poetry, um, you know, Ahmatova's poetry uh, can seep into my English re- language nonfiction. Um, so I think that was sort of a very formative part of my reading uh, as a child, but also, you know, to this day. I loved reading um, the Yiddish authors, Shalom Aleichem, Isaac Babel, Basheva Singer. I read them in English. Um, and then in Stern, I spent a lot of time reading modern Hebrew literature, uh, also first in English and then in Hebrew. And I actually ended up writing my undergraduate thesis on Amos Oz's memoir, uh, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Uh, so that sort of was, a, I think, a huge impact on me as well. In terms of journalists and essayists, um, you know, I have a bunch. I think I really admire and actually teach often the uh, interviews of Italian, the Italian journalist Oriana Falacci. She was a very courageous journalist. Uh, she's actually already passed by now, but um, she sort of interviewed these heads of state and did these incredible things. She interviewed, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini and took off her veil during the interview. She was a very brave uh, reporter. She was actually quite pro-Israel. She had other political views that were sort of very controversial. Um, But her courage as an interviewer, her ability to ask questions in terrifying situations was amazing to me always. Um, I revere Joanne Didion's prose and her social observations are just so exquisite. And uh, I think, you know, today's writers, sort of frequently published writers, I'm a big fan of Taffy Broadusser Ackner, who is a master at profiling. Where does she write? New York Times, and she's sort of known for her profiles, um, her profiles of celebrities specifically. But she also did come out with a novel, Fleischman is in Trouble, recently, which I think is now being made into a film. Uh, She's she's just something about her her uh, creativity with prose like she really pushes boundaries like in a New York Times profile she just sometimes I think there was one moment I think it was in her profile of Gwyneth Paltrow she just she repeated a sentence like she just verbatim yeah verbatim repeated a sentence because she just wanted to make that point and I was like (laughs) what are you allowed to do that (laughs) yeah are you allowed to do that but she does and she just she just goes with it and I I love that I love that she breaks the formulas um yeah, tell me one more. I'm going to give you more than <laughs> Okay, I'll give you one more. Gia Talentino. She's, uh, she was at The New Yorker. I don't know what she's up to now, but she had a, a collection of essays recently called Trick Mirror. Um, and that, I think her essays in describing sort of millennial American culture and this moment in time are just so smart and interesting. I don't always agree with what she has to say, but the way she writes is so beautiful. I I need to thank you because I sometimes hang out in circles that have allowed me to convince myself that I am well-read. And uh, that list uh, has reminded me that I am, in fact, not as lettered as I sometimes convince myself that I am. That was uh, really, really extraordinary. I I, Part of what I wanted, and I want to get to this in one moment... Um, you know, it's the summertime, people are uh, relaxing, everybody's looking for something to read, and I want to hear your examples of literary nonfiction articles or books, and I want to get to that in one moment, but I-, I wanted just to return as a final, you know, the writing process, I want to return to the social media component and the criticism. You undoubtedly have found yourself centered in different 
social media criticism, both from within your own community, from people adjacent to your community. And it's something that I think anybody of, you know, somewhat notoriety who's pro prolific in any way deals with. And I wanted you to maybe return and, and tell me more about how do you practice self-care to ensure that criticism online doesn't metastasize and trickle in to your, not just your home life, but your very self-conception. Why doesn't it seem to rattle you in the way that, you know, like for me, if I get, you know, just a, 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 a not even nasty, just like some basic negative tweet, like I could be knocked out. Like I, it, I have thin skin, and I've learned to appreciate the fact that I have thin skin. So what do you do to practice self-care? Do you have very thick skin? Do you, do you fight back? Do, what is your kind of philosophy of self-care as a writer in the public square in the Jewish community? You know, it's funny you ask this question because I was literally just thinking about this yesterday. Um, you know, I started, I feel like I blur out a lot of, the criticism, as I said to you before, I don't remember what people say about, you know, which article or whatever. Um, and I, I think it's sort of, that's part of the coping mechanism. Eleanor Roosevelt said that a woman in the public eye must develop a hide as thick as a rhinoceros. And, um, yeah. And I feel like life has sort of forced me to do that, even though that's not my nature. My nature is, is, you know, I like to please people. I like to make people happy. I'm not people pleasing. It's my Achilles heel. Totally. And and it's it's really not my nature. I never was. I was always like a good girl. Like I was like I was like the yearbook editor. I was the, you know, the girl who got the awards, the principal's favorite. Like that was my, you know, that is, you know, my personality, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to write and say what I want to be able to say. Um and I think recently I started realizing, literally just yesterday I was thinking, I was looking through some, I don't remember, there was like a social media post that someone mentioned to me. And I started remembering how I basically, since I've been very young, have gotten used to people posting terrible things about me um, publicly and like about me as a person, right? It's not like posting a link to an article saying, wow, this is, this is a terrible article and I really disagree with it for X, Y, and Z reasons. Like, no, they will go personal. Um, and I honestly don't know how I got through that at that age. Now I feel much more, you know, kind of relaxed and comfortable, not comfortable. We don't like comfortable in journalism, but I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I, I know who I am. Right. And, and I don't know how I went through that at that age. And I've definitely had hard moments. I will share one story where, um, there was one time that I will never forget. I once tweeted something pretty innocuous, uh, saying that, you know, young female journalists in Israeli media experience harassment on the job. Um, and that I had experienced that as well, like literally basic, vague sort of supporting someone who was talking about this issue at that moment. And I guess the Israeli media was having a slow news day that day because they needed to manufacture something. Uh, so the next day I wake up and my phone is buzzing off the hook. Um, I'm getting messages from all the top Israeli news channels and someone sends me the front cover. I think it was Makori Shon, one of the Israeli papers, say, with, uh, which had a photo of me taken of me at a big, at Hazen Helfgott's daughter's wedding, I think. Um, me and my husband, we were, I think, engaged at the time. And, and with this headline that this, you know, religious journalist, rabbi's wife, says she too was harassed on the front cover of an Israeli newspaper. Um, it was a nightmare. Um, it was, I don't like, it was literally just, I was supporting someone saying that this, you know, this exists and the entire Israeli media was overwhelmed with this story for some reason in that moment. And I remember it was a Friday morning and then Shabbos day, we had shul members coming over you know, who were reading Israeli news and they were sort of making comments like, you're, you know, Avital, what is she doing? What is she saying? She shouldn't say things like this. Someone brought a cutout of the actual print paper to my husband's office to like make a point of it. Um, and Sunday morning I had to, and I was sort of overwhelmed by this. How could this have happened? I literally just tweeted something so simple with nothing, you know, but it was enough that people wanted to just bite and, and, and blow it up. And Sunday morning, I had to attend a, 
a sort of a luncheon for some event, a function at the St. Regis Hotel. And I'll never forget like getting dressed and like getting to that Uber and just sort of thinking to myself, I need to put on a smile right now. I need to be strong. I know that the entire community is talking about this. I need to be strong. I need to smile. And I remember getting out on Fifth Avenue and like literally the thought running through my mind, if I jump in front of a bus, what's going to happen? And I don't think I've ever experienced that in my life, but in, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm a pretty stable person, but it was, it, it pushed me to my limit and it had a very, you know, dangerous, I think, effect. It could have a very dangerous effect if one lets it affect you. Um, so, you know, the way I deal right now, first of all, I don't read. I really, I don't, meaning I don't read comments. I don't, I don't engage. I actually told both my parents and then my in-laws, I had to have conversations with them and I told them, I don't need, I don't read the comments and neither should you for your own sanity. Someone who takes the time to write a disgusting talk back or post something derogatory on social media, it tells you something about the person if you ask me, right? Again, something personal, not a disagreement with what the person is saying. Um, and, and that, you know, I think it's telling and we shouldn't be busy with that. Um, so that's sort of my one rule. And, and you're able, uh, Avita, I'm almost, I'm not questioning that you're, that you're not telling the truth. You are really able to not read your comments. You're going on the record saying a hundred percent at this point, at this point, I do not read. I do not read responses to my tweets. I don't have Twitter on my phone. Wow. I don't read my mentions and I, I literally, but, but I've had to do that in order to protect myself because the last thing I want to do is to read that. And literally I've had people, people used to send me sort of screenshots and links. Did you see what this person is saying about you and this person? And I have, had, I have had to go back to these people who are my friends and say, listen, thank you so much for being worried about me, but I just don't need to read that. Like, I don't need to see that. It's not, you know, again, if someone disagrees with me, people who respect me, who disagree with me, almost always write me an email in which they lay out their points. And that it's a totally different story, right? Um, but this is, it, these are character assassinations. There's no reason for me to see that. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think it has, it, I think in general, Twitter specifically has had, but this happens on all platforms, but Twitter has really done something terrible to our brains. And I've watched many media colleagues, honestly, kind of spiral out of control because they're affected by that, they're, by the algorithm, by the machine, by this sort of, you know, the reward for, for mm -hmm. hysterics and for emotion, right? Because that's what gets you attention. And I think um, you know, I, I really want to stay away from that as much as I can. Like what I post online is what I really just want to post online. It's not because, you know, of uh, following and growing my following. Thank God I'm happy with my following. I don't need more of it. Like it's, it's fine. Um, so that's number one. It's sort of trying to sort of shield myself from it. And the second piece is back to my pinned tweet. Really faith helps me. Um, it, sometimes it still is hard and I, I really, I pray for strength. Um, you know, and I remind myself that I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to follow in the footsteps of a long history of voices who were silenced or harassed for what they did in the Jewish community. I mean, we used to burn books, right? Like this is not a new phenomenon at all. And right now, actually the stakes are pretty low compared to what they used to be. Um, and my husband always reminds me at the end of, you know, the Megillat Esther and the end of the book of Esther, we say Mordechai Ratzoy L'Rov Echav, that Mordechai was loved by most of his brethren and not all of them, right? And this is someone who just literally just saved the entire Jewish people. You can save the Jewish people from genocide and still not everyone will love you, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, and you have to remember that. That's just the reality, that's human nature, first of all. And there are other factors as well. And I know who I am. I know what I stand for. I feel confident, at least for this, that I'm following the path that Hashem set out for me. And sometimes I just tell myself, I literally put this as my WhatsApp status this week. That my soul should just be like dust to everything. I shouldn't, it shouldn't bother me. It shouldn't care. And I say this as a journalist. I say this as a writer, as a, as a Rebbiton, to be honest. Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I experience this every single day in different levels. And that's just the only way to get through it. Not to not be reactive. That is really extraordinary. Let me just give a quick shout out because we haven't mentioned him by name. Your husband, Benji Goldschmidt, who I also know uh, for quite some time and 
was in uh, yeshiva with his brother. We have a lot of intersections, but that obviously is not. To go through all of our familial connections uh, would require an entirely different interview. Uh, Really what this is about, and I want to get to this, uh, I know it's at the very end, but what uh, I think people, it's the summertime, people are looking for things to read, things that are enjoyable, that they can access. Can you give me three examples of literary nonfiction articles and books that you love and why you love them? Sure. So um, I think they're all light enough that you could read them this summer. Though generally, I tend to be a dark reader. Um, yeah, I, I I just discovered that when you started reading Tolstoy at 12 years old, so... <laughs> it affects you. Um, yeah, I think I would start actually going back to Joan Didion. Um, I read this essay in college, and it's sort of typical, but I just, I come back to it frequently. It's called Goodbye to All That. And it is a short essay which really captures New York City. Uh, the place that it is and all it means, especially in youth. Um, She just has this beautiful prose where she can weave in the personalities and the locations and the just the images are so New York. And having lived here for over 10 years, it's I really feel like she that's one of the best portraits of the city in literature today. Um, Do you want me to read a quote from it? Yeah, please. She's, she writes, I still believed in possibilities then, still had the sense so peculiar to New York that something extraordinary would happen any minute, any day, any month. You see, I was in a curious position in New York. It never occurred to me that I was living a real life there. Uh, she sort of captures this very fleeting city I experience. Love that. Yeah, and, and, and it's actually describing her leaving New York and she's reflecting on that. Um, and it's... Also, just sort of living here and again in, in, a, in a you know large shul, large synagogue in Manhattan, and seeing all the people who come through here, I, f- I find that that tra- transitory experience of New York, New York being like no other city in the world, is so on point. Okay, so the first is Joan Didion. Goodbye to all that. Give me two more recommendations. What's your number two recommendation? So number two is a long one, and I mentioned it already. It is the the subject of my thesis, A Tale of Love and Darkness by Amos Oz, uh, which is a story about the writer's life growing up uh, at the birth of the state of Israel. Uh, It's also a story of nostalgia and a story of an unrequited love for Europe that many immigrants, uh, I think, felt in Israel at the time. This is, he starts in the 30s in British Mandate Palestine. Uh, And I think it's a generally... It's a story of immigration, and I have obvious reasons for why I related to it. My parents are immigrants, uh, but I think it's actually very uh, timely with the sort of a conversation around Israel right now. He has this one line where he says, Jews go back to Palestine, the graffiti in 1930s Lithuania urged his family. So they went. Then later, the walls of Europe shout, Jews get out of Palestine. And I think that really sums up in a very... wow brief way exactly what many Jews feel both in Israel and outside. And your final recommendation for a summer nonfiction read. This one is a short one. Uh, it is an essay in the Paris Review by Sabrina O'Remark titled You Break It, We Fix It. And it's, uh, I think it was in November, late last year, she published it. I was amazed that someone could literally write a Dvar Torah in the Paris Review. Uh, where she talks about sort of reflects on the pandemic and this feeling of brokenness, and she relates it to uh, you know the the tablets, the the set of ten commandments that uh, Moses broke. So she says in Exodus, the first set of ten commandments broken by Moses is not buried but placed in the Aron Hakodesh, the holy ark, beside the new unbroken tablets, which the Jews carry through the wilderness for forty years. I imagine the broken tablets leaning against the unbroken ones, telling them secrets only broken. I imagine the weight of the broken tablets and the heat and the thirst and the frustration. Why didn't we just leave the broken tablets behind? What good is all this carrying? To know your history is to carry all your pieces, whole and shattered through the wilderness and feel their weight. Wow, telling them secrets that only broken things know, that is... I remember reading that piece, so I'm one for three uh, in your recommendations, and that was an absolutely 
chilling spe- uh chilling piece and and really really moving uh and our listeners should definitely uh check that out R- remind me what her name is sabrina ora mark ora o r a h beautiful beautiful okay uh i always wrap up with a little bit of rapid fire questions i hope that that is um okay my first question is is there a book again we've recommended a lot of books on subject matter and we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty of reading books about the act of writing itself are there any books about writing itself that you could recommend to our listeners that have inspired your process okay there is a book by lisa crone it's called story genius Story Genius. Yes, I think it's called Story Genius. Uh, There's a subtitle of some sort. Story Genius, how to use brain science to something. (laughs) It's it's basically, it's a story. It's a book about what what makes a story. Um, And she has another book called Wired for Story. And both of them sort of dive into um, the psychology behind plots. What makes a plot interesting? What makes our why our brains are wired towards some plots versus others, sort of how to how to layer a story really well. And it's largely, I think, written for fiction writers and for screenwriters, uh, but it's, but it, it totally, it helps the journalist as well, right? Because I, as a journalist, let's say my, one of my next stories, I have a whole, you know, a wealth of facts, a wealth of information. My ability to sort of, to, to build that story well relies on some of the psychology, right? Uh, so I think that's really important. And then the other, sorry, I'm gonna give you two answers. And the other thing is just to to read excellent prose. And some one senior journalist told me this years ago as his advice to me, which is to say that if even if you want to write academic or journalistic writing, uh, it can help to read just great poetry or to write, you know, to read great fiction, something that just read great sentences, read the way that people, you know, write eloquently. And, um, and that I think has had a huge effect on me, I think more than most sort of on writing types of books. I I am of that school too. It comes from my father's Rebbe who, when my father was, uh, you know, getting into Torah learning for the first time, he would always say, don't learn about it, learn it, learn which it. is just immer- immersing yourself in that great prose. Avital, if somebody gave you a great deal of money that allowed you to take a sabbatical for as long as you needed to either go back to school and write a PhD or to write a book, what do you think the title and subject matter of that book or PhD would be? Oh my God. That's a tough question. Um, it would definitely be a book. I have no interest in doing a PhD. Um, oh. We'll be honest, and I would definitely spend that time in in Jerusalem. Uh, what title? I'm I'm actually very bad at titling. I usually or subject matter. Meaning, what's the subject matter that you think you would gravitate towards? I have answers, but I can't say them on this podcast. <laughs> you have answers, but you cannot say them on this podcast. Maybe that is a subject in and of itself. The things yes. that are left unsaid. Yes. Let's, uh, yes. I will let you off with that as an answer. Uh, it, it, your, your subject matter will be things left unsaid. And then finally, I always ask, because I'm always fascinated by people's work routines, what time do you go to sleep at night? At what time do you wake up in the morning? I have recently shifted this considerably i have never been a late or early person i just sort of went to bed at 11 and woke up whenever my kids woke me up now i go to sleep early i go to sleep by 10 and i wake up at 6 you go to sleep at 10 p.m yeah taking twitter off your phone it'll do wonders not always sometimes i'm up later but i'm you know i'm usually unless i'm unless i'm hosting (laughs) unless you're hosting the hostess yes you wear yeah You wear many hats, and I am so appreciative, and it was such a privilege that you shared so many of them with us today. Avital, thank you so much for joining us on 1840. Thank you so much for having me. I absolutely loved my conversation with Avital. I find her to be incredibly insightful and, more than anything else, incredibly courageous. There is a way that she writes 
where she weds both her advocacy for the issues that she feels strongly with, but with a prayerful religiosity that I think animates so many of the words that she shares. Of course, I don't always agree with the positions or the issues that she highlights. I don't agree with anyone. That's the beauty of reading and connecting to people. But what I do always agree with 100% of the time is the conviction and the clarity and the beauty with which Avital shares her ideas. And I can think of no one more qualified to talk about how to share Jewish and religious ideas in print in a prayerful way without kind of sucking away all of the complexity, spirituality that informs so much of the transitions and issues in religious communities. She's able to wed that journalistic instinct that requires a little bit of sobriety when you approach those issues with something far more prayerful and spiritual. And her ability to integrate those two together is something I have always found nothing short of remarkable. I promise that I would share three recommendations of my own of things that you can find online and print out and read on your own. So first and foremost, before I get into the three, I just want to recommend to all of our listeners, if you don't know about this website, find it right now, and that is longform.org. Longform is a colloquial word, it's probably been added to the dictionary now, that's used to describe what I would call narrative nonfiction, which is nonfiction articles, things that really happened, real people, real stories, but it's shared not in that very cold, like a textbook, but it's shared as a narrative. I think the person who really kind of created this genre of writing is most famously Truman Capote with his book In Cold Blood. It's a little bit of a violent book, but you could definitely read it on a, on a beach if that's what excites you. But aside from Truman Capote, this has literally exploded these true true-to-life narrative nonfiction, taking a real story, a real incident, but sharing it with the flair, curiosity, and storytelling that we normally associate with fiction. So there are three recommendations. I'm not going to read them for you because they are very long form. These are long articles. Uh, Some of them have even been um, later repurposed into books. But I want to recommend three for you because I think they tell really powerful stories about religious life itself, and they are all worth reading. The first story was originally published in the New York Times Magazine called Choosing My Religion by Stephen J. Dubner. It was published in March 31st of 1996 and was later published as a book. You can find the entire article online, and I found it absolutely moving the way he talks about his navigation with Jewish life, with religious life, It is absolutely worth reading, and I'm going to read with each of these articles. Oops, uh, cut that, cut out that buzz. And I'm going to read with each of these articles what I find to be just a really beautiful highlight for each of them. And this is what Stephen J. Dubner writes in Choosing My Religion. The rabbi, a soft-voiced, sad-eyed old man, turned out to be the boy's grandfather. He stepped forward to give a sermon. During these days of reflection, he said, he had been asking himself, what makes us keep on being Jews when it's such a struggle? And I found the answer in six words, he said. Six words in the Talmud, written by Rashi. He will not let us go. It isn't a matter of choosing whether to quit God, the old rabbi explained. It is God who chooses not to quit us. And I found that passage to be so moving and so powerful in his journey, and I absolutely loved it. And he's one of the most fantastic storytellers, Stephen J. Dubner, what he does in Freakonomics. I'm sure you've heard of his books or his podcasts. He's unbelievable. The reason why, another reason why I'm sharing this with you now that story that he has from his rabbi, six words in the Talmud written by Rashi, he will not let us go, is that I have no idea where this Rashi, the great commentary on Talmud, 
uh, where this Rashi even is. And I did email Stephen J. Dubner a while back to find out, and he was kind enough to respond, but even he didn't remember. So if there are any listeners who remember six words in the Talmud written by Rashi, he will not let us go. What on earth could this be referring to? Uh, I have a couple guesses, but if anybody knows, I would very much appreciate you reaching out. There is a second article, which I also found absolutely wonderful, and that is an article that appeared in Rolling Stone magazine. Yes, you heard correctly, Rolling Stone magazine, and it was published in April 21st of 1977, so you have to go a ways back, and the article is by Ellen Willis, and it's called Next Year in Jerusalem. And the subheading is that when her brother embraced Orthodox Judaism, the author began to question her own reality and went to Israel to find some answers. Now, you may not appreciate the, the journey that she goes on or where it ends, but if you appreciate how to read, how to enjoy a story, then it doesn't really matter uh, how it ends or what she went through. It's just a phenomenal story where she goes to Israel after her brother enrolls in Eish HaTorah, the yeshiva that still exists now, right outside of the Kotel walls. And her journey to Israel and contending with religious ideas, and she met with, at the time, the leader of Eish HaTorah, and the fact that this story appeared in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, which is not in my, you know, I, I was never a subscriber, but I certainly don't associate Rolling Stone magazine with uh, stories about Teshuva and return, but she did an absolutely a phenomenal job, I thought, in this article depicting what religious doubt, contention, journeying is all about, which is why I am so excited uh, to recommend this article for you again next year in Jerusalem, and you can find it on rollingstone.com. I'll read just a, a quick passage towards the end. Uh, no spoilers, you can close your ears if you don't want to know. Uh, it just has a little bit of uh, foreshadowing of what happens. But she writes, Mike, meaning her brother, had been 24 when he became religious. I had been 23 when I came out of my deadly depression. It seemed to me that both changes represented the same basic decision to be happy. But mine had been purely intuitive decision to allow myself to feel. His had presented itself as an intellectual decision to go where his logic led. Perhaps our paths were equally valid, perhaps not. As I kissed my brother goodbye, I still did not know whether my refusal to believe was healthy self-assertion or stubborn egotism. The Bible, the Jews, the Bible tells us, are a stiff-necked people. I think that this is a beautiful paragraph and a beautiful story about siblings journeying, trying to find and make that decision to be happy, what's necessary, your heart, your mind, you work with both. It's a brilliant story that appeared in Rolling Stone magazine, and I don't know if any of our listeners know what became of her. Uh, I would, I'd be so happy to hear or to know, find out more, but Ellen Willis, uh, really a brilliant writer and an incredible story that is worth reading and relaxing enough and interesting enough that you can get through the whole thing on the beach. The final story is not as focused specifically on the Orthodox community or even the Jewish community. It's about a religious community and a religious sect and somebody leaving this sect and developing a healthier relationship with themselves and religious ideas. I remember reading this article in one sitting. I could not put it down. And the title of the article is Unfollow by Adrian Chen, and it appeared in the New Yorker in November 15th of 2015. And it is the story of how one of the daughters of the Westboro Baptist Church, which is one of the most inflammatory religious sects that has ever been out there. You know, they're the ones who have those very ugly signs and protests outside of funerals. I don't want to go into it more. You can read the article to find out more. But what is really incredible is how one member of this church began to question their own religious commitments and ended up leaving the church and how they left and fostered a healthy relationship 
with religious communities, with Jewish communities, I think is an incredibly moving story of how religious communities can sometimes suffocate, but other times empower and breathe life into somebody's discovery of sense of self. And what I found so powerful about this article is that it really tells both of these stories. And people have experienced both even within one lifetime. What's also kind of remarkable and, and, and really uplifting is that much of her journey is facilitated through the Jewish community, the very community that she one time protested against and blamed against for all of these apocalyptic theological reasons. She ends up coming back and really embracing a healthier sense of self through her connections to the Jewish community. So it's a story of modernity, it's a story of growth, it's a story of religious growth, and it's a story of how boundaries of religious communities, particularly in the age of social media and online engagement, have really shifted in a lot of ways. That You could tell the story also from within the Orthodox community. I'm obviously not, God forbid, making any comparisons between the Orthodox community and the Westboro Baptist Church. I mean, they, these are not good people. Uh, and that's 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 really, really clear. but the the idea of questioning and figuring out your place within community has definitely been challenged, uh, not in a bad way, not a bad challenge, in a healthy challenge uh, because of the way that we interact and see so many other ways of living in so many other communities. That's part of the challenge, crisis, excitement, freedom, opportunity of modernity that we cover so much in 1840. So again, the three article recommendations, find a, a good printer uh, where you can uh, print these out, read them on a beach, Choosing My Religion by Stephen J. Dubner, that appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Ellen Willis's article, Next Year in Jerusalem, from Rolling Stone Magazine, and finally, Unfollow by Adrian Chen, that appeared in The New Yorker. So thank you so much for listening. And I've been getting a lot of feedback about my closing, and I'm thinking of revamping it. I usually say it wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of schnarring, but people have been trickling in and telling me that is playing into Jewish stereotypes. So even though I obviously meant it in a playful way, people have asked me to find a new way to wrap up your episodes, and I am in the process of doing so. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, Please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or any of the other great ones we've covered, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org, 1840.org. You'll also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. Thank you so much for listening and stay curious, my friends.